Well, good morning. If we could take our Bibles and open them to the book of Romans, uh, chapter 15. The book of Romans, chapter 15 and verse 22. If God allows it, we're going to try to cover verses 22 through 30. Three this morning. So we're approaching the end of the book of Romans, and no, it will not take us six months to finish. Maybe three months, but not six months. Romans 15 and verse 22. The title of our message this morning is Travel, Money, and Prayer. Three interesting subjects that Paul brings to our attention. Travel, money, and prayer. Um, Of course, we are in the midst of a study on the book of Romans, and there's the outline we've been following, and we're at the very end of the book where Paul is giving us some concluding thoughts. Romans 15, verse 14 through the end of chapter 16. And that section has several parts to it. There's about seven parts to it. And we saw last week Paul's motivation in writing, verses 14 through 21. And now we take a look this morning at his intention to visit Rome, verses 22 through 33. I would strongly encourage you to resist the temptation to mentally check out at the end of a book, particularly a biblical book. Because as I've been reading this final section and studying and trying to prepare, I'm, I'm seeing all sorts of things in this passage that I can hardly see straight. The Lord is showing me so many things. And he will to you too, because all Scripture, not some, all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable, including things at the very end of a book. His intention to visit Rome Uh, I was just up at the men's conference where we had a chance to listen to Chuck Carpenter of Southwestern Theological Seminary teach, and he is a Baptist, a Baptist, and Baptists are known for alliterations. And I'm terrible at alliterations, but some of Chuck's ambiance must have rubbed off on me, and lo and behold, I've got an alliteration here. We have Paul's desire to visit Rome. I hope you like D's, verses 22 through 24. Three D's, a three D study, I guess we could say. Number two, Paul's detour to Jerusalem, verses 25 through 29. And then finally, number three, Paul's demand for prayer, verses 30 through 33. Now, it was about 5.30 this morning that I was in Bobby Hannon's truck coming back from the retreat, and I said to myself, I should have entitled that third one, Paul's Dependence Upon Prayer. So it was too late to fix it, though, so you're stuck with a demand for prayer. But uh, notice what Paul does here in verses 22 through 24. He begins to express this desire that he has always had to go to the church at Rome and minister. And notice, if you will, verse 22, which is his past desire to visit Rome. This is something that God always put on the heart of the Apostle Paul. It was an ache in his soul that wouldn't really go away. And notice what he says in verse 22. As for this, I have often been prevented from coming to you. In the past, Paul says, I've always wanted to come to Rome. You remember Paul was in Corinth when he wrote this. And he always wanted to visit the church at Rome, but for some reason or another, his plans never materialized. Things never worked out. Now, why is that? Well, we don't know. Perhaps it was Satan thwarting him. Paul wrote something similar to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 18. He says, For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. If God has placed a goal in your life for you to accomplish for him, and you can generally tell what that goal is because there's an aching desire that you have that doesn't seem to go away, 
a business you're supposed to start, uh, a ministry you're supposed to start, uh, an unsaved loved one you're supposed to preach the gospel to, whatever the case may be. It's this ache in your soul, this desire that won't go away. You can be assured that Satan will try to come between you and that goal, if it's a God-ordained goal. So likely it was Satan that was thwarting Paul's ambition, his desire or his plan to visit Rome, something that God put on his heart, and yet it kept being interrupted. Now, this is very important for us to understand because many Christians uh, embark on something for God, and because things don't work out the first time or they don't materialize right away, or the circumstances don't fit, they say, well, I guess I'm outside the will of God. But may I just say to you that Paul's plans did not work out many times. And yet he never threw up his hands and said, well, I guess this desire to visit Rome is somehow outside the will of God. He never gave up on it. And so if God has put something in your spirit to do, don't give up on it. Don't assume that it is not God's will for you to do it just because things don't work out. It's likely the reason things are not working out is because you have spiritual opposition. Satan is not going to sit back and let you just go ahead and fulfill God's goal for your life. He will try to interrupt it. And in fact, the interruption... And the warfare that you go under when you attempt to do something for God is the very sign that you're in the will of God because you're a threat, you see. And Satan hates threats. Uh, when I played college basketball, we had a guy who was recruited to the Denver Nuggets, and that's a pretty strong uh, endorsement of an athlete because I was only playing at the Division three level. And every time this guy had his hands on the ball, he was a threat to the other team. So they double teamed him, they triple teamed him, they quadruple teamed him, they thwarted him at every attempt because he was a threat. And the moment you begin to move towards a God-ordained goal, as Paul was moving towards his God-ordained goal of visiting Rome, is the moment he was a threat and is the moment uh, his path was hindered or blocked. So Paul says, I wanted to come many times, but things just never seem to materialize. As we drift down into verses 23 and 24, he moves from his past desire to visit Rome to his present desire to visit Rome. This desire I've had, Paul says, has never gone away. Notice, if you will, the first part of verse 23. But now with no further place for me in these Regions. The reason Paul wanted to visit Rome is because he had already saturated the geographical areas where he traveled with the gospel. There was nowhere else to go with the gospel. Everybody had access to the gospel. Churches had been planted. And so Paul has, as we have talked about, the heart of a missionary. His ambition is always to go where Christ has not been known yet, or where Christ has not been proclaimed. Last week we saw Romans 15 and verse 20, which says, And thus I inspired to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would build on another man's foundation. Paul says, I'm not interested in building on another man's foundation. I'm not interested in planting a church on top of another church. What I'm interested in is going to territories where they don't even have a church. And then they don't even know the name Jesus. And this is where Paul wanted to go. So we have his past work accomplished, drifting down also into verse 23. You also have his desire to visit Rome for many years. And notice what he says. And since I have had for many years a longing, you want to underline that word longing, a longing to come to you. This is a desire on my heart that doesn't seem to go away. You run into many Christians and they ask, how do I know what the will of God is for my life? And my answer is simply this. What do you want to do? What is a, what is, is there some sort of desire that you have that continues to nag at you? And it could be a desire in any different number of areas. 
Psalm 37 and verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. One of the ways God works is He puts a desire on our heart, which is actually His desire. See how sneaky God is? And then we will move in the direction of seeing that desire fulfilled. And lo and behold, we're accomplishing the will of God, thinking it was our desire all along. When in reality, it was something that God put into your soul. That's what Paul had with this ambition to visit Rome. As you go down to verse 24, he begins to explain his plan to visit Rome. I mean, why did he want to go to Rome so badly? He has a strategy in mind. Notice verse 24. Whenever I go to Spain, and I hope to see you in passing, and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. Paul's goal was not to get, not simply to get to Rome, but to get to Spain. Now, as you look at the eastern side of the map, you see where Paul was in Corinth. That's the first circle. And then as you travel westward and upward, you'll see Rome. That's where Paul wanted to go. And Paul wanted to use the church at Rome as a beachhead by which he would launch out further west and into the territory of Spain. The geographical location of the church in the book of Acts is always shifting. The church started, as we know, in Jerusalem, and then it began to travel northwest. From Jerusalem, it went to the, t- the northern tip of Israel to a place called Antioch. We read about the Antiochian church in Acts 11 and many other places. And then from there, it continued to travel westward to a place called Ephesus. This is where Paul spent three years in a school called the School of Tyrannus where according to Acts chapter 19, verse 10, the whole area heard the gospel because of Paul's ministry there. And then God continued to push the church westward as its center of authority began to change. We learn to Rome. And Paul says, I'm not happy with just being in Rome. Should I ever get there? But I want to take the gospel all the way to Spain. Paul wants to take the church at Rome, which, as we have studied, was founded without the help of an apostle, and found that church in correct thinking and doctrine. And he does that largely in this book, but he would do it further when he came to them. And then once that church is on a firm foundation, it's already a very successful, thriving church. But you see, to Paul, the issue is not necessarily success or thriving. The issue is, is the doctrinal foundation stable? Because a successful, thriving church that is not built on the right foundation can be shifted. Satan does that to churches all of the time. Paul didn't want that to happen to the church at Rome because he wanted to use Rome as the next center of the church and he wanted to venture all the way into Spain. Notice what he says here in verse 24. He says, uh, when I come to you, I want to enjoy your company. Now, to Paul, it wasn't all about uh, ministry goals. It wasn't all about uh, missionary work. It wasn't all about setting up uh, scenarios whereby the gospel could go out further. That was certainly part of Paul's thinking. It dominated Paul's thinking. But he says, I also want to come and I just want to be with you and enjoy your company. Because to Paul, ministry was not just about achieving goals. It was about relationships and relating to people. Notice that Paul is ministerial and he is relational at the same time. He is goal-driven, but he values personal intimacy personal contact with fellow believers. In fact, he even says here, if you look at verse 24 very carefully, I want to be helped on my way. Now, earlier in the book of Romans, chapter 1 and verse 11, if you can remember back that long, and by the way, it was longer than six months, it's been about a year, but all the way back in Romans chapter 1 and verse 11, Paul would write these words, for I long to see you, 
that I may impart some gift to you that you may be established. Paul wanted to get to Rome to ground that church on proper doctrine. Now, at the end of the book, he says, I also want to get to Rome because I want to be helped by you. I want to help you, beginning of the book, and I want to be helped by you, the end of the book. Notice the body concept there. What is church? What is Christianity? What is ministry? Ministry is about being involved in the body of Christ where we bless others and other people simultaneously bless us. Paul is operating with both here. He doesn't just want to help. He wants to be helped. And that's one of the great things about being in ministry. You can be a blessing to other people. But other people, as you'll see as you move out into God's will, will be a tremendous blessing to you as well. So we have here in verses 22 through 24 his desire, if you will, to visit Rome. Now as we go down to verses 25 through 29, we learn about A, and of course that was all supposed to be up as I was speaking. Actually, no, that wasn't supposed to be up as I was speaking. I actually had it right this time. It's always embarrassing to be up talking and the PowerPoint that you're lecturing from is not up. But fortunately I was rescued from that, praise the Lord. We have number two, his detour to Jerusalem. This uh, ambition that he had to get to Rome was being detoured with another project. And uh, that project is the detour to Jerusalem there in verses 25 through 29. So we have his detour to Jerusalem, verse 25. Then we have a general and a specific reason for his detour to Jerusalem, verses 25 and 26. We have the motivation of Gentiles participating in this project, this new project that Paul is going to spring on us here, verse 27. Then you have an explanation of his travel plans, verse 28. And then finally he gets back to his anticipated visit to Rome, verse 29. I want to get to Rome. However, there's another project brewing here that's going to sideline me for a little while. Well, what is that project, Paul? Notice, if you will, verse 25. But now I am going to Jerusalem. Instead of going to Rome, I've got to go to Jerusalem. Well, Paul, why are you going to Jerusalem? Paul says, I'm glad you asked. Notice the second part of verse 25. I want to go to Jerusalem. Notice the last phrase, to serve the saints in Jerusalem. You see, what was always on the mind of the great Apostle Paul was not himself, but it was other people. As you study all of these letters, you learn that he is always interested in investing himself into the lives of other people. Paul did not have a serve us mentality. He had a service mentality. Of course, the great passage on that is Philippians 2 where Christ is the ultimate model of servanthood. And that theology ruminated in Paul's life as he began to think about these saints in Jerusalem, as well as Rome, wanting to serve them. Well, we have a general purpose of the visit. What is the specific purpose of the visit, Paul? What tangible way, uh, what practical way are you going to serve the saints in Jerusalem? Notice, if you will, verse 26. For uh, Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Paul is raising money for the church at Jerusalem. The church at Jerusalem, where Christianity started, had fallen on hard times. Now, why is that? Well, one of the reasons they were having difficult financial times is because of the scenario that we read about in Acts 2, where they were living in a communal way. We study Acts 2, we learn that the Jerusalem saints began to sell their property to have cash on hand. They liquidated their assets to have money on hand so that they could be of assistance 
to people from all over the known world that wanted to come and sit at the apostles' feet and learn apostolic doctrine. Why can't those people just read the New Testament? There isn't a New Testament yet. So how do you get your doctrine for the age of the church that's just started? You've got to get it from the lips of the apostles. Where were the apostles? They were in Jerusalem. Well, what if you wanted to come out, come and hang out with the apostles for a while? Well, it costs money. Not money as a fee, but you have to leave behind your livelihood and business to come to sit at the feet of the apostles. And the Jerusalem church saw this financial need that was developing. And so those that lived in Jerusalem and had property in Jerusalem started selling their homes. Acts 2, verses 44 through 45. They liquidated their assets so that they would have money on hand to help others coming from the known world who wanted to learn apostolic doctrine. Now, liquidating your assets is expensive, isn't it? And so this is why the church at Jerusalem was suffering financially. There was also a famine, Acts 11, verses 27 through 30 in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem was ostracized because it was being rejected by unbelieving Judaism. The church at Jerusalem was being taxed twice. They were paying taxes to Rome. They were paying tithes to the nation of Israel, which was still functioning as a nation up until A.D. 70. And they were the ones also who were sending out everybody. I mean, everything that we have in terms of missionary work starts in Jerusalem. It costs money to do that. They were the sending church, what we call the mother church. And so for all of these reasons, the church in Jerusalem, the saints in Jerusalem, had fallen on to hard times financially, and Paul is, is collecting money to help these financially suffering saints in Jerusalem. All the way through the New Testament, and I have all the references there on the screen, you'll find Paul referring to this offering project that he's taking up. This is why he can't go to Rome as he wants to. There's something else brewing. There's something else bubbling. There's another matter that has to be attended to. Now, as you look at verse 26 very carefully, notice what it says. He mentions Macedonia and Achaia. Now, what we have to understand is that when Paul wrote the book of Romans... This was Paul's sixth letter. He has already written five letters. The letter he wrote just before this is 2 Corinthians. And in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, he devotes his most uh, attention to this offering project for the saints in Jerusalem. And it's from those chapters that we develop the principles of grace giving. One of the questions that Christians frequently ask is, do we have to tithe? Uh, I was on the radio show with Bruce uh, last week, and that question comes up quite frequently. Do we have to give 10% of our money to the Lord? And the fact of the matter is, the whole issue of tithing is a command given to the nation of Israel under the prior dispensation. And if you want to put yourself under that system, you really should not be giving 10% of your money to the Lord. You really should be giving 23 and a third percent of your money to the Lord because the nation of Israel had three tithes. Two were annual, one was collected every three years. But what does the New Testament say? Does the New Testament teach this issue of tithing? Is tithing something that is binding for the church age? And the answer to that is it is not binding. Tithing is not mentioned in the epistolary literature which governs the church. What is mentioned are the principles of grace giving. We are not governed by numbers. We are governed by principles of grace giving. The number that you give is between you and God. Israel was a nation. She had numbers. She had a specific number of finances that had to be given to the government. But we are not a nation. We are a peculiar people that are dispersed in all nations. 
And so we are not governed by the principles of tithing. We are governed by the principles of grace giving. So what you discover in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 are various adverbs that describe how to give. They modify how to give. Give generously. Now I've got verses not only here in 2 Corinthians, but other passages. Give generously. Give regularly. Give voluntarily. Give joyfully because God loves a what kind of giver? Cheerful giver. Give worshipfully. God receives our financial gifts to him as a form of worship. Give proportionately. Give as God has prospered you. Some people I don't think should be giving 10% because it will push them so far into the red they'll never get out again. Other people should be giving far more than 10%. But numbers are not the issue. The issue is do we understand the grace of God and how it applies. Give proportionately. Give sacrificially. In other words, give till it hurts. (laughs) Jesus said give quietly. Don't announce it with trumpets. Don't uh, demand that a building be named after you, for example. Because if you do that, the rewards will come around at the Bema seat and Jesus will simply look at you or look at me and say, you already had your reward. Don't you remember how you promoted yourself? But the one that gives in secret will be given a reward. And you'll notice there in verse 26, he has mentioned the Macedonians. This is the same crowd that Paul talked about in those chapters on grace giving, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Those verses say this, Now, brethren, we wish to make to know, known to you the grace of God which, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Paul says, you folks in Rome, as I take up this offering, I want you to note the principles of grace giving, which are recorded in my earlier letter, and I want you to take note of the Macedonians. Remember what I said about the Macedonians. They were people who were touched by the grace of God. And because they were touched by the grace of God, they wanted to extend grace to others. And that impacted their financial philosophy. They gave out of their deep poverty. I mean, these people had nothing to give, but they gave anyway. They gave with great liberality. They gave, Paul says, beyond their ability. They even begged us and pleaded with us that they could participate in this offering project. The principles of grace giving. Notice there in verse 26 he mentions Achaia. That's another group he talks about in those two chapters on grace giving. He says in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 2, For I know your readiness of which I boast about you to the Macedonians, namely that Achaia has been prepared since last year and your zeal has stirred up most of them. These are people that thought about how much they were going to give, put it aside, and therefore when I would arrive they would have bountiful supply on hand to help me with this offering project. In fact, they were zealous to participate, and their zeal rubbed off on other people. Paul, why do you want to go to Jerusalem? I want to help the suffering saints there because I'm involved in this offering project. Now, as you drop down to verse 27, you see his motive. What is the motive for participating in this offering project? Look at this very carefully. Yes, they were pleased to do so. That would be the Macedonians and those in Achaia. And they are indebted to them. Watch this very carefully, verse 27. For if the Gentiles, 
have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. Why should we care about the troubled saints in Jerusalem? Paul says you owe them something. Because they are the mother church, they are the sending church, you have benefited tremendously and spiritually because of them. And now, during their time of difficulty, you ought to think about them because you wouldn't have anything spiritually if that church had not sent out missionaries to reach you. But I think there's more to it than that. Paul seems to make a point of their Jewish orientation. Every single Christian, up until probably about Acts 10, maybe Acts 13, in the book of Acts was a Jew. All all of them were Jews, Jewish Christians. And so when Paul is speaking of the troubled saints in Jerusalem, he is reminding his audience that the of the fact that these people that have helped you, not only are they your brothers in Christ, but they are Jews. Now, there is a pattern and a program of God. God has ordained that he would operate a certain way. God's method of operation is clearly spelled out at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 12 and verse 3. God said to Abram, who would later become Abraham, as he entered into the Uh, Abrahamic covenant with this man Abraham and started the nation of Israel. God said, in you, that's Abraham and his descendants, all the families of the earth will be blessed. God says, I'm going to ordain and work a certain way. I am going to funnel my blessings to planet earth through the nation of Israel or through the Jews, through the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and and Jacob. Now you might say to yourself, well, why did God choose to do it th- that way? My response is, I have no idea. Ask God. It's his program, not mine. But this is how God decided to work. And you will note that every single blessing we as Gentile Christians have has come to us through the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There is not a single spiritual blessing that we enjoy today in Sugarland, Texas, in the year 2012, that has not come to us through the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There are many blessings we could articulate, but there are three main ones. Number one, the Scripture. Every single book of this Bible was written by a Jew, possible exception Luke, who wrote Luke and Acts. Every other author is Jewish. Number two, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus was as Jewish as they come. Jesus was not an American. Jesus was not a Southern Baptist. Jesus was not a member of a Bible church. Jesus was a Jew. Just study the Gospels. You see Christ religiously going to attend the various Feasts of Israel, because that's what Jews did. Study the genealogy of Matthew chapter 1, and you'll see Matthew linking Christ back to David, a Jew, and then to Abraham, the first Jew. Had it not been for God's work through Israel, we would not have the Scripture. We would not have a Savior. Now, there is a third blessing that's on the horizon. If I were a replacement theologian, Or a Reformed theologian, I would say that God has finished blessing the world through the Jews. But may I just say to you that Israel is the gift that keeps on giving. Because there's yet a third blessing that's coming. And that is the kingdom. Which is described in Isaiah 2, verses 2-3. through It talks about the nations of the earth going to worship Jesus in Brussels, no. Washington, D.C., no. New York, no. San Francisco, certainly not San Francisco. But in Jerusalem, the word of God will go forth from Zion. This kingdom 
time that will last a thousand years when the nations will beat their swords into plowshares. The nations will learn of war no more. Agricultural prosperity will break out upon the earth. Spiritual knowledge will break out upon the earth. How, how is all of that going to come to the world? It's going to come to the world through the nation of Israel, through the city of Jerusalem in the millennial earthly kingdom. You see, and this is how God has decided to work. I will bless Israel and Israel will bless the world. Now, when Paul says, as you're thinking about giving uh, and taking up money for your offering, you ought to keep that point in the back of your mind as well. That these folks that are suffering there in Jerusalem are all Jews. Are they Christians? Yes, but they were Jews first. And you ought to think about that when you decide whether you're going to financially help them or not. Because, frankly, you Gentiles would have absolutely nothing. You would have no spiritual blessings at all had it not been for God's work through the nation of Israel. So Paul says, verse 27, you are indebted to them, you owe them something. A, that's the mother church that sent every all, every all the missionaries out. And number two, they're Jewish. So think about that, Paul says, as I pass the offering plate. Now we move into verse 28 where he begins to describe his travel plans. Notice what he says, verse 28. Therefore, when I have finished this and have put my seal on this fruit of theirs, I will go on to you, I will uh, go on by way, come to you rather, and then to Spain. What is Paul's travel plans? Well, he's in Corinth now, that's the middle circle. And then he wants to go to Jerusalem, that's the eastern side of the map. And then once he drops off this offering there to the saints in Jerusalem, his goal is to go to Rome. As you travel westward, you'll see Rome there in Italy. And Paul says, I'm not satisfied at staying in Rome. Once I get Rome on the proper theological foundation, I will use that church as my missionary headquarters to venture into unknown territories, particularly Spain. I'm going to keep traveling westward. That's what Paul wanted to do. Corinth to Jerusalem. I'll give them this money that I have been raising. He calls it fruit with his seal on it. Then to Rome and then to Spain. Well, what happened? Paul got to Rome. But he didn't get there the way he thought. He thought he was going to get there as a free man. God says, look, I'll get you there, but you're going as a prisoner. Did Paul ever make it to Spain? I don't know. I have no knowledge of whether he made it to Spain. I just know that Paul here is expressing his heart. And this I share with you to tell you that, yes, God will in your life, fulfill the desires of your heart. If he has put those desires in your heart, he will fulfill those. But you might be surprised at how he fulfills them. I mean, when Paul prayed, I I want to get to Rome, I don't think he ever prayed, I want to go in chains. But that's how God got him there. There are things that have happened in my life that I have never anticipated. I just know that I had basic desires, and I would pray to God about those desires being fulfilled. And then all of a sudden, over the course of time, the hand of God begins to move in my life. These desires that I prayed about for many years start to come to fruition, but they didn't come to fruition the way I thought they would. For many years in my life, I wanted to be a teacher of the Word of God. That is a desire that God placed in my heart. I thought I was going to go to Dallas and go back to California and be a teacher of the Word of God. God, I never asked to go to Houston. I never asked to come to Sugar Land. Didn't even know there was such a city. 
But God ordained it in such a way that that's where I would go, at least for the time being, you see? And so many times God puts these desires on our heart. We pray God fulfill these desires, and then God will move his hand and he'll begin to fulfill those desires, and we're completely shocked at how he does it. But my suggestion is don't be shocked. Don't be surprised. Paul never asked to go to Rome as a prisoner, but that's how that desire of his heart was met. That's how that desire of his life was fulfilled. Now, as you drop down to verse 29, you see his anticipation in coming to Rome. Notice verse 29. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Paul says, I want to get to the church at Rome because I want to bless you. What blessing could Paul give to the Roman Christians that they didn't already have? The answer is apostolic doctrine. The church at Rome, if you study this map very carefully, was one of the few churches that was founded without the help of an apostle. How did that church at Rome start? There are different views on it and different theories. I think the best theory is Romans, who were Jews, were present on the day of Pentecost and they heard Peter's sermon. Because a Jew, according to Leviticus 23, had to show up in Jerusalem as part of Judaism. And there were many feast days that the Jews had which mandated participation at a central sanctuary. Leviticus 23 mentions these various feast days. And so Jews from all over the known world would travel to Jerusalem as good Jews. It's just that the Holy Spirit had a surprise for them. The Holy Spirit, through Peter, would preach the gospel. And many Jews were saved. In fact, Peter when he gave this opportunity to believe in Christ, extended that invitation, you've got 3,000 people that believe the message. That's quite an altar call. 3,000 converts. Now, some of those who believed were from Rome. And so what did they do? Well, they had the new message of the cross, the gospel, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They went back to where they came from, and they started a church. And the church became very uh, influential. It began to prosper. In fact, we saw all the way back in Romans 1 that the reputation of the church at Rome was known throughout all of the known world. But Paul says, I've got a problem with what you all are doing there in Rome. You don't have apostolic doctrine yet. How could you? You don't even have a New Testament yet. And I want to use Rome as a beachhead to move out into Spain. So I need to come and ground you in apostolic truth. And once you are on that solid theological foundation, you will not be swayed into false areas by the adversary. And I can use you as the center of the church and as an opportunity to extend out into Spain. That's the blessing that Paul wanted to give him. Apostolic doctrine. And you have to put yourself in the position of a believer in Jesus Christ who does not have the New Testament. Paul says, I'm the writer of the New Testament, and I'll come tell you about the New Testament. I'll give you the doctrine that God has given me. It will later be recorded in letters, 13 letters Paul would write, but I want to give it to you face to face. I want to come to bless you. When he says I want to go to Rome, he's not saying that the gospel has never gone to Rome. What he is saying is I want to bring apostolic doctrine that will root believers in Christ in Rome in the truth in what they have believed. So we have Paul's desire to visit Rome, verses 22 through 24 we have his detour to Jerusalem verses 25 through 29 and finally we conclude with his demand or better said his dependence upon prayer he begins to as he has described these two goals that he has he begins to express his dependence 
upon the prayers of God's people. It is a staggering thing for me and for you to note that the great Apostle Paul, the man who had all of these abilities, all of this education, all of this knowledge, uh, his apostleship directly from God, that he felt the need to request prayer on his behalf. He says, for example, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6 and verse 19, he says, And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Paul says, I am completely dependent upon the prayers of God's people. So how is it that we think here at Sugarland Bible Church that we can just write a check, send out some missionaries, and then we're finished with the project. We have to lift these people up in prayer. I mean, if Paul needed prayer, our missionaries need prayer, don't they? I teach the Bible five times a week. I teach it four times at the college. I teach it once here. I am more in need of the prayers of God's people Probably than I've ever been in my whole life. I just, I just sense it. I mean, if Paul needed prayer, I need prayer. Your leaders need prayer. Those that run the church need prayer. The missionaries that we send out need prayer. I mean, we ought to be a praying people. And notice what Paul says there at the beginning of verse 30. He says, now I urge you, brethren, By our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit. This is the motivation for the intercession. Why pray for me, Paul says. Because the triune God, and he mentions there in verse 30, two members of the Trinity. He mentions the Spirit and he mentions Jesus Christ. The triune God loves this world. The triune God, as we celebrated at the communion table, has done everything within his power to redeem humanity. And now the message has to go out. Paul says, right now in my life, I am a vehicle of that message. God is expressing his love to a world that he has died for through me. And therefore, pray for me. Because as you pray for me, I am fulfilling God's will, and I'm showing this world that God loves this world as the message goes out. What is the motive for the intercession? The motive for the intercession is love for the world. Why pray for a missionary? Love for the world. Because that missionary is a carrier of the message of the grace of God. And how can we not lift them up in prayer? Since they have the message that's necessary for a lost person to be saved. If nothing else, Paul says, pray for me because of love. That you understand that God loves this world. And God is working through me. Paul says, I'm a participant in the divine plan. Pray for me. Notice the nature of the intercession. Notice, if you will, the second part of verse 30. To strive, you ought to underline that word strive, to strive together with me in your prayers to God. Strive is more than God bless the meat, now let's eat. It's more than a meal prayer. It's more than a quickie. It is this idea of agonizing in prayer for people. That's what strive is. Strive is this idea of exercising yourself in prayer. Striving in prayer. uh, Exerting effort in prayer. Making prayer a priority. Notice this word together. He says, I want you to strive together. That is speaking of corporate prayer praying as a body for somebody carol sends out every week the prayer requests all sorts of prayer requests come out of this office for all sorts of people in all sorts of circumstances what an opportunity it is to take a moment of time and pray for that person 
Because as you're doing it, someone else is doing it. And as someone else is doing it, a third person is doing it. And suddenly you've got the body of Christ striving in prayer, corporately or together, for an individual. Corporate prayer. Strive, he says, to God, that's the object, for me, that's the beneficiary. Now, Paul, what are we supposed to pray for specifically? Paul says, I'm glad you asked. Notice, if you will, verses 31 and 32. He says, pray for three specific things. Number one, pray that I am delivered from unbelieving Jews. Notice verse 31, that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea. The greatest opponents of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the book of Acts were unbelieving Jews. Just read the book of Acts and you'll see it. They hated the gospel. They tried to stamp it out. Were there Jewish converts? Of course there were. 3,000 came to Christ on the day of Pentecost. But the rest, particularly the Sanhedrin, was doing everything within their power to stifle the message of the gospel. Paul says, I need physical deliverance from these people. Pray that I will be delivered from unbelieving Jews. Number two, second thing to pray for, also in verse 31, pray for the believing Jews. Who would those be, Paul? The folks I'm raising the money for in Jerusalem. Pray for them. Why? Why do they need prayer, Paul? Paul says, look at verse 31, the second part of the verse. That my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints. Pray that they will accept. Pray that they will receive this offering that I am raising. Pray that their hearts will not be so proud and so lifted up that they are unable to receive a gift. Because I know they're hurting financially and I'm raising up money for them. It is a lot easier to give a gift than to receive a gift. I would much rather be the giver than the receiver. Because if I am the receiver, I am admitting that I am in the place of need. That's why receiving handouts, help, is such an attack on human pride which thinks it can solve all of its problems on its own. Paul says, pray for those believing Jews that their hearts may be softened and that they may be recipients of this great offering that I am raising for them. Because giving is easier than accepting. And then the third thing Paul says to pray for is his coming visit to Rome. Notice verse 32. So that I may come to you in joy by the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company. Pray for deliverance from unbelieving Jews. Pray for believing Jews that they can accept the offering. And pray for my journey to Rome. Because I want to come to you with joy and in the will of God. And by the way, when I come, I'm not just going to teach. I'm going to receive refreshment from you. I'm not just going to give, but I'm going to receive. Because I am part of a body. Something Paul talked about earlier. Notice, if you will, the concluding benediction, verse 33. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Paul wraps up his thoughts by saying, may the God of peace be with you. I love this designation of God as the God of peace. Because frankly, there is no peace without him. First of all, there is positional peace. Where we, by exercising faith in Christ, are made right with God. Peace, positionally. Romans 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then secondly, there is experiential peace. There is a deep inner sense of contentment that a person can receive from the Holy Spirit, even though all hell is breaking out in their life. And there's only one deliverer of that, and that's the God of peace. 
Paul would write in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard, that's a military term, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. A peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Positional peace, practical peace. You see, there's a lot of things he's revealing to us about his heart and his motivation and many things that we can apply to our lives. As we've studied his desire to visit Rome, verses 22 through 24, his detour to Jerusalem, verses 25 through 29, and his demand or his dependence upon prayer, verses 30 through 33. Shall we pray? Father, we remain grateful for the great Apostle Paul and what he penned for us at the end of this letter. Help us, Lord, to take these truths and tuck them deeply into our hearts that we may apply them to our lives. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory and God's people said. Uh, We talked about Paul's fear that the Jerusalem saints would not be able to receive a gift. Well, here's a gift for you. Number one, there's a free lunch following the service. Well, I didn't bring anything. Well, um, I, who do I pay? Forget all that. Just go back there and enjoy yourself and fellowship with God's people and a meal provided by the church. But, you know, a meal only satisfies you for about a few hours. I've noticed that with me the satisfaction level is getting smaller and smaller. I keep... I used to say 12 hours or 24 hours, now it's like two hours, but maybe that's another spiritual problem I have. But there is a, uh, a meal which is satisfactory for eternity, and that's the gospel. Jesus, when he spoke to the woman at the well, he said to her, you know, you can drink all you want from this physical water. You'll be thirsty again. But let me talk to you about water that is living water, that satisfies the deepest longings and the cravings of the human heart. That's what the gospel provides. And just like lunch is free, the gospel is free. Jesus stepped out of eternity into time for one specific purpose, to absorb the wrath of our sin in our place. The wrath of God that belongs on us was absorbed by Christ. He validated who he was through his resurrection from the dead. And he leaves the human race with a simple message. And that message is this. If you believe, which is another word for saying trust, another word for saying confidence, another word for saying reliance. Those are all synonyms. Faith, belief, trust, confidence, reliance. If you rest in simple trust in what I've done for you, then you have the hope of heaven after you die, and you know that your sins have been paid for, and you have the living water that Jesus Christ offers. The Holy Spirit has come into the world to convict the world of unbelief. The Holy Spirit right now, I believe, is convicting people of unbelief. There are people that have come to this church and they've never really trusted in Christ. May I just ask you, may I just exhort you, as the Spirit of God has you under conviction, to trust in this message. It's not something you have to raise your hand to do. It's not something you have to walk an aisle to do. It's not something you have to join the church to do. It's not something you have to give money to do. It's between you and the Lord, and it takes place really within the quietness of your own thoughts and your own heart. As the Spirit convicts you of unbelief, you simply respond to that by faith and trust in what Jesus has done. That's something you can do right now. And if it's something you need more information on, any of us up on the stage would love to talk to you after the service. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, 
To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Greet someone you don't know on the way out. God bless you. You're dismissed.